from U.S. companies um, as they are looking to transfer European citizen data to the United States. As privacy professionals, we have been advising many of our clients who are understandably upset when, in October of last year, the European Court of Justice rendered the decision in Max Schrems versus Facebook, which immediately invalidated the United States Safe Harbor, which had been in effect for 15 years as a basis for that cross-border data transfer. So over 4,000 U.S. companies that had self-certified under the safe harbor were left wondering what's next. And in the aftermath, we had multiple questions from clients about how are we going to get European data of our employees into a centralized HR database in the United States? Um, what do we need to think about in terms of our cloud providers? and from an acquisition perspective, uh, data rooms that were midstream in process of a transaction cross-border between the EU and the U.S. were left wondering what to do. In February of this year, in 2016, there was an announcement of a replacement for the safe harbor called the Privacy Shield. One of the topics that Alex and myself will discuss is the new Save the new privacy shield and what are the alternatives to keep business running between the United States and the EU. Um, in December of 2015, another great development happened on the privacy front uh, in the EU. EU finally reached political agreement on the general data protection regulation after almost three years of waiting for that. And Dan Revel will help us do a walkthrough of the GDPR um, and its implications for U.S. businesses. But first, let's talk a bit about the agenda on the safe harbor and the privacy shield. We'll cover um, what the old safe harbor um, encompassed and how the gaps will be in terms of the new privacy shield. Um, and also because in the face of all this uncertainty over the last several months, business must go on between these global economies. Um, many of our clients are very anxious to continue those data transfers and not want to be out of compliance. So we'll look at alternatives that can be put into effect today, as well as you know, what will be required to come under that new privacy shield and some practical tips and the UK perspective. Uh, Dan, can you give us an overview of your section, please. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Brian. So what I'll do is just talk through very, uh, at a very high level a few of the key issues that are coming out of the GDPR that will affect every business um, <clears throat> and explain which of those obligations will necessarily affect and which, which won't and the tests that have to be met in determining whether or not you need to um, uh, comply with those obligations. I'll just say a few words as well about Brexit and the possible implications of the uh, UK's exit from the European Union and what that might mean to the GDPR uh, in the UK. And then um, finally, Sharon and I together will just talk you through a few, uh, few pointers, a few practical tips on what we think all organisations should be doing and thinking about both with regard to the transfer of data from the UK to the US, but also in gearing up for the uh, impending implementation of the GDPR. Brian, next slide. Thank you. While the United States and the EU share the goal of enhanced privacy for its citizenry, the approach is quite different. Um, and that's the genesis of where we've been in the safe harbor and beyond. So in 1995, the original EU data protection directive allow the transfer of personal data to other countries that had an adequate level of protection of that European fundamental right of privacy. Um, the United States was not deemed adequate because it has a very different privacy structure. So the nations worked together and the United States Department of Commerce in, consult in consultation with the European Commission developed and then it received an adequate 
uh, adequacy finding from the commission in the year 2000 um, to put a safe harbor in place. Brian, next slide. Um, the safe harbor was really a process of self-certification annually on seven fundamental privacy principles. Notice, choice, onward transfer, access, security, data integrity, and enforcement. And 4,000 plus U.S. companies annually did the certification for 15 years. In addition, they had a privacy statement that the company adheres to the safe harbor that was published and enforced by the FTC so that the companies had to say what they were doing by way of the safe harbor and do what they said. Well, that is all over, next slide, um, as of October of 2015, when based on the PRISM allegations by Ed Snowden of mass surveillance by the United States government on European citizens, the Court of Justice of the European Union invalidated the safe harbor, as I mentioned, in the Schrems versus Facebook decision on October 6th. And then there was a grace period where they were struggling to find a way to have some strong obligations on U.S. companies handling EU data, safeguards that would guard against the United States government access, and redress by EU citizens. So next slide, along came the Privacy Shield. Um, just two days after the grace period of, was ending on January 31, um, the text was announced and the decision was released on February 29th of 2016 for adequacy. Now, that's the U.S. side. Where we are is the EU side needs to weigh in. So the Article 29 Working Party has to give its opinion on the adequacy decision, which we hope to be in late April. And then the individual EU nation states um, must also adopt it. But in the meantime, the safe harbor remains an invalid transfer mechanism, and we're not out of the woods yet. Now, we will go and talk about the privacy shield and some alternatives, again, that you could do today, um, as well as what that privacy shield will mean for you as businesses. But before we present that from a U.S. perspective, Dan, we just wanted to seek your opinion quickly on what are the chances that the EU will approve um, and provide an adequacy decision on that privacy shield? Well, it's a good question. I think our view is that the Article 29 Working Party is highly likely to approve the uh, Privacy Shield, either in its present form or perhaps subject to a number of amendments that it uh, requires. But I think that the Article 29 Working Party will be under huge political pressure to, uh, to approve the Privacy Shield, simply because um, it, if they don't, it will appear that the European Commission is once again doing something that is uh, arguably inhibiting trade between Europe and the United States. And I think that uh, at the moment in the current political climate is potentially further ammunition for any pro-exit campaigners, not just in the UK, but also across, uh, across the wider um, European region. Um, having said that, I think we all need to be mindful of the fact here in Europe that if the Privacy Shield is uh, ratified and does become uh, a given legal basis, um, there is always the possibility, of course, that it could end up being challenged in European courts in exactly the same way that the um, safe harbor was challenged, as um, Sharon's explained. Um, and I think because of that, I suspect that the uh, Article 29 Working Party is working incredibly hard at the moment to satisfy itself that the um, their privacy shield will be a, a regime which would withstand scrutiny and further test at the uh, European courts. Thanks, Dan, very much for that perspective. Next shield, or, I'm sorry, next uh, slide, please, Brian. So for companies that are looking for a mechanism to uh, transfer personal data from the European Economic Area to the U.S., what will participation in the Privacy Shield look like? Well, not surprisingly, since it is a replacement of the old safe harbor, it's going to look a lot like compliance with the safe harbor regime looked. Companies will have to annually self-certify their compliance with Privacy Shield principles. 
uh, these principles largely track the old safe harbor principles with some important differences, particularly with respect to notice. They'll have to publicly declare their commitment to comply with the principles. As part of compliance with the notice principle, they'll have to provide what amounts to a privacy shield privacy policy. You know, U.S. companies are very familiar uh, with these kinds of uh, disclosure documents. Many companies that uh, operates a website that collects personal information in the U.S. will uh, have one of these uh, up or should have one of these up. And the Privacy Shield uh, requirements are very similar. They'll need to uh, disclose the types of data that are being collected, and the purposes for which it's being collected, and with whom they might share the data. Uh, in order to be eligible to participate in the Privacy Shield, a company has to be subject to FTC or Department of Transportation regulation. Now, this is uh, just like the Safe Harbor in that it um, excludes certain financial institutions like banks, credit unions, uh, savings and loans, uh, certain telecoms, common carriers, and a few other industry sectors. Uh, the Privacy Shield does contemplate that other regulatory authorities uh, may be added in the future, which could increase the scope of participation in the Privacy Shield, but at least initially the scope of participation is going to be just as it was in the old safe harbor. The next slide, please, Brian. So, if participation in the Privacy Shield is going to look the same as Safe Harbor in many respects, what are the important changes? Well, there were a number of items uh, in the Privacy Shield that attempt to address the deficiencies cited by the Court of Justice of the European Union and certain EU organizations prior to that. Um, foremost among these are attempting to demonstrate that there are limits uh, on national security, a U.S. national security agency and law enforcement collection of personal data. Uh, the primary uh, item that was pointed to uh, to demonstrate these limits were Presidential Policy Directive uh, number 28, which creates certain uh, limits around the collection of personal data for uh, national security purposes in the U.S. Uh, policy Directive number 28, however, was enacted by President Obama back in 2014, so query whether uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union uh, didn't consider that when they handed down their decision last year and whether, in light of that, it will be sufficient to satisfy the EU that U.S. government access is sufficiently restricted. They also provide uh, EU citizens with additional rights and legal remedies. Congress passed the Judicial Redress Act, which will provide EU citizens with the same rights to judicial remedies in the United States as U.S. citizens for U.S. agency uh, violations of the U.S. Privacy Act with respect to handling of their personal information. And there's going to be a new ombudsman office in the U.S. State Department, which will provide individuals from the EU with the ability to submit inquiries regarding uh, U.S. Intelligence, a intelligence agency handling of their data. Uh, there's also some additional enforcement items or enforcement commitments by the Department of Commerce. Um, some of these are the same as in the Safe Harbor, but the Department of Commerce is also uh, committed to taking a, a bit more of a proactive role by, for example, expanding its efforts to follow up with organizations that are no longer participating to make sure that they are adhering with respect to data that they previously collected, and searching for and addressing false claims of participation. Um, also, the third bullet point there, which I just skipped, uh, oversight is an important issue uh, under the Privacy Shield, and there's going to be an annual joint review mechanism where the U.S. and EU will evaluate how the Privacy Shield is going. Next slide, please, Brian. There's also a number of uh, changes that have operational impact for participants. Uh, I already touched on the additional information that is going to be required to be provided for uh, uh, under the notice principle. Uh, there are also tightened conditions for onward transfer to third parties. That is, if you're sharing with, for example, uh, a, a third party controller, there are requirements uh, for contracting with that party to make sure that they comply with the principles and also have sufficient security in place. The Privacy Shield gives companies 45 days to respond to individual complaints, a time frame that was not present under the old safe harbor, so there are going to be, uh, a company will need mechanisms to make sure that they're tracking complaints and addressing them in time. If the Privacy Shield provides additional avenues to address individual complaints. Uh, the uh, EU individuals will be uh, allowed to take complaints to their home DPA, which can then refer complaints to the FTC. And there is an arbitration mechanism of last resort, which is styled as the Privacy Shield Panel, uh, which is and it allows to award non-monetary remedies for violations of the Privacy Shield, which could be significant if the non-monetary awards uh, provide that 
companies need to change their procedures in order to comply with uh, the principles. Um, organizations transferring human resources data uh, must now cooperate and respond directly to data protection authorities regarding the processing of HR data. Under the previous uh, regime in the safe harbor, uh, companies had a choice as to which enforcement mechanism they use. They could use uh, binding, independent binding arbitration or comply with uh, the DPAs and inevitably arbitration would be chosen because they wanted to avoid uh, uh, being under the thumb of a strange regulator. But there's also explicit liability for a third party agent's violation of the principles. For example, if you provide it to a third party vendor on your behalf, they violate the principles, you're on the hook for that. And participants to drop out have to, have to continue to comply with respect to data that they collected uh, while they were participating in the privacy shield. And next slide, please, Brian. So for companies that previously relied on the safe harbor, in the meantime, while private, the privacy shield is being finalized, uh, what are alternatives that they can use to uh, be in compliance with their obligations with respect to the transfer of data? Uh, one very good alternative is use of model clauses, which are standardized data protection contracts that are approved uh, by the EU and uh, local DPAs. They come in a couple different flavors, controller to controller or controller to processor, depending on the relationship of the uh, entity exporting the data and the entity importing the data. And they're basically just contracts that set the ground rules for the transfer of the pers personal data from the European Economic Area to the United States. Uh, they're relatively easy to put in place. It's just a matter of executing a contract. The companies need to keep in mind that these model clauses need to be in place for each entity to whom uh, they transfer data and for all types of data that are transferred. So it can become more difficult to operationalize model clauses uh, for businesses that have a very large number of partners or uh, if with whom they're sharing da data or if the types of data that are going to be shared will change over time. Um, under the current uh, member state implementation of the directive, approval of local DPAs is also sometimes required for use of model clauses. That is an item that will change under the new general data protection regulation. Approval will no longer be required and so that will make model clauses even more attractive as a, a mechanism for compliance in the future. Uh, next slide please, Brian. Uh, binding corporate rules uh, are another method of compliance. They're legally enforceable privacy rules for a corporate group. Um, an example of a situation where this would be a good choice is if there's a multinational corporation with subsidiaries in the EU that need to transfer human resources data back to a U.S. parent company to process that data to fulfill the human resources function. Um, the pros are that they are enterprise-wide, so once you have them in place, they will apply to all the transfers of personal data from the EEA to the U.S. Uh, the, con, the major con is that they take a lot of time, effort, and money to put in place, both internally within the organization because they are enterprise-wide and also externally they require approval of DPAs so you have to pass some regulatory hurdles to get them implemented. And they're also only valid for transfers between the corporate groups so uh, transfers to third-party vendors can't be included within this mechanism. Next slide please. Uh, consent is also an alternative that can be uh, used in certain circumstances and consent is just agreement of the data subject to transfer of their data. Under the directive, it has to be freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous in order for the transfer to be valid. And there are some changes to uh, consent under the GDPR and the requirements for obtaining consent. Uh, importantly, for uh, transfer of the data, the uh, consent uh, now has to ha include an affirmative action. So, for example, simply having a privacy policy on a website where you purport to get passive assent just through use of the website uh, from the user will no longer be um, allowed under the new DPR. So this can be an attractive option when a company has direct contact with the data subject and can implement a process like a click-through agreement uh, to obtain that consent. Um, companies, though, do need to be mindful that it, consent can be interpreted restrictively and particularly in the employment context when there is seen to be an imbalance of bargaining power between the parties. Also, uh, data subjects may not consent and they can withdraw their consent at any time. So those are a few other things to keep in mind. But all in all, consent can be a really good solution or at least a really good belt and suspenders approach in certain situations where there is that direct content with the data subject, for example, in the business to consumer website where uh, certain transactions are occurring 
with information being provided directly by the data subject. Next slide, please. Just a couple of other quick alternatives to uh, cover uh, under the uh, uh, Data Protection Directive. There are these derogations, which are simply situations where transfer is also allowed. Uh, these remain largely intact under the GDPR. A common one to use would be transfer necessary for the performance of a contract. For example, if an order was taken from an EU citizen and that data needed to be transferred back to the U.S. in order to fulfill that order. Um, like consent, which is also uh, a derogation, these are limited and interpreted somewhat restrictively. So these are really better off uh, used for uh, one-off or limited data transfers uh, rather than uh, mechanisms around which an entire compliance regime for a company should be built. Um, so with that, I, I'll pass it to Dan to uh, talk a little bit about the UK perspective on personal data transfers following the invalidation of the Safe Harbor and uh, with respect to the new GDPR. Thank you, Alex, um, for that. Um, what was interesting when um, the uh, European Court judgment was handed down, which invalidated Safe Harbor, was that we were contacted by uh, an awful lot of clients in a pretty short space of time, all asking the same question. Um, we can't use Safe Harbor anymore. What do we do in order to ensure compliance for our overseas data transfers? And what we found in many instances was that the uh, organizations in question weren't actually using Safe Harbor properly and that the recipient in the States wasn't really uh, properly ratified under the Safe Harbor regime. So it was a, a bit of a wake-up call for a lot of organizations. And I think generally it brought the whole issue of overseas data transfer compliance into greater focus. What we, um, by and large, advised to all of our clients is that the starting point, if you've not got consent to transfer the data, uh, and you can no longer use Safe Harbor, is to seek to utilize the model clauses that Alex has just, um, just described. And by and large, that, that tends to work in most situations and for most um, organizations. But one thing that we were, um, and we're always very keen to do when we're, we're advising clients um, on overseas transfers, is to explain that you don't just put the model clauses in your contract uh, and, and think, well, that's it, we've complied. There's rather more to it. You've really got to actually live those model clauses. You've got to ensure that you are complying with the security obligations and the provisions in those model clauses, um, and don't just pay, pay lip service to them. Um, one area in particular where um, the safe harbor ruling caused a certain amount of chaos for a short period of time at least was in the, um, and in, within corporate deals and M&A transactions where a target company was um, in the European Union and a bidder was in the States, and the bidder needed to carry out a due diligence exercise, and typically via an online data room. And in order to do that, it needed to access information about the target business, and inevitably that would include personal data, so employee uh, details and so on. And the, the sellers um, quickly um, cottoned on to the fact that allowing uh, US companies to uh, access this information was, was possibly causing the seller to be in contravention of the data protection legislation. So a number of deals actually ground to a halt. Um, what we uh, assisted with in that instance was a helping put um, NDAs in place, typical bidder type NDAs in place, which embedded the, uh, the model clauses as well. And, and, and typically um, bidders were willing to sign up to that. And we've actually helped the British um, Venture Capitalist Association in putting, putting together standard form contracts on, on that basis. And we've also seen that online data rooms, which previously had used servers in the States, have brought them back into uh, the European Union or built new data centers in order to avoid, it, avoid this problem uh, entirely. With the Privacy Shield itself, I, I think that um, we'll quite quickly find uh, we're in a situation where um, businesses in the States that, that uh, routinely receive personal data from Europe, particularly if that is part of a service offering, will have to have um, Privacy Shield accreditation. And if you've not got it, you, you uh, will find your competitors have got it. And therefore, it will become a sales badge. And it will be um, um, one of the first questions that is asked of the recipient by the, by the EU customers. Um, and then just finally, on, on the UK perspective, um, I'll come on to the GDPR in more detail in a second. But um, with regards to overseas transfers of data, um, interestingly, the GDPR doesn't really do an awful lot. It doesn't change the current regime, and it maintains a lot of those concepts we're familiar with, like the adequacy findings of whitelisted countries uh, and the derogations um, that Alex has, uh, has touched on as well. 
Um, what, it, what it does do, which I think is beneficial to a lot of businesses, it actually um, strips out some of the more um, difficult um, rules that apply in certain European countries, not, not the UK, but certainly somewhere like Belgium, for example, if you want to use the model terms, your European business, you have to seek prior approval from your regulator before you can sign up for model terms every time that you use them. The GDPR will do away with those sorts of, um, of obligations. Um, just turning now to the, the GDPR itself, the General Data Protection um, Regulations, and one of the questions which I was certainly was asked um, a few years ago on a regular basis was why on earth do we need these regulations? We've got this huge Data Protection Act, um, it's very complicated, there's a lot in it, a lot of compliance obligations, we don't really see why we need anything new. Well, the answer to that question really lies in the history uh, of the, and the genesis of the Data Protection Laws, the Data Protection Act. 1998 in the UK, came off the back of a, a 1995 directive which was debated and drafted in the early 90s at a time when uh, widespread use of the internet, the World Wide Web and emails just simply wasn't anticipated at all. So by the time it came into force in the UK in 99, it was already uh, outdated. And then since then, of course, um, we've had um, the use of uh, you know, mobile computing, smartphones and tablets, the internet of things, and big data. And social networking, um, of course, none of those things really are, um, uh, are, are addressed properly in the, in the Data Protection Act, so it's simply not fit for purpose. The other question which I'm regularly asked is, where are these laws? We've been hearing about them for, for years, and uh, they were the original draft of the regulations was published in January 2012, and it's actually um, the, the piece of legislation which now holds the record for having been um, debated the greatest length of time in the European Parliament. Um, where we are now is actually in a, in a, um, a fine-tuning period where the, the um, specific text of the regulation is just being um, uh, agreed, but the, the vast majority of the, the concepts uh, and the issues which, which we all need to know about have already been signed off. That happened before Christmas. The final ratification of the text, we were told at a talk last week by the Information Commissioner's Office, is due around June, there will then be a two-year uh, lead-in period, so we can expect to see the GDPR coming into force sometime around June uh, 2018. Um, just before getting into the, the, the nuts and bolts of the GDPR, um, I should just say a word about the, the obvious elephant in the room. Um, if the UK leaves the EU, do we really need to worry about any of this? Uh, is it even relevant? Well, I think the answer is yes, it, it, it almost certainly will be relevant. Um, First of all, if we vote to leave the EU as of June, by the time we actually leave legally, um, the GDPR will, will have already been implemented. So there will be a period of time when we have to comply anyway in the UK. Um, it, it, even uh, ignoring that, we will probably end up joining the EEA if we leave the EU, um, which means we'll, we'll, we'll probably end up buying into the GDPR in any event. And aside from all of that, e even if we, we don't um, um, end up being um, part of the GDPR regime, the UK, of course, will be seen as an overseas uh, country for the purposes of data protection regulation, and it will want to ensure that it gets an adequacy rating from the Commission. It is effectively whitelisted so that it can receive um, personal data freely from uh, continental Europe in order to facilitate business transactions and so on. So the easiest way to do that, of course, is uh, simply uh, have the GDPR on your statute books in the UK. Okay, so what's actually in the um, GDPR? Well, I'm not proposing to go through all of it. Uh, let me say we haven't got time to do that. But what I wanted to do is just touch on some of the key uh, issues which will apply to virtually all organisations. Um, and all of these are pretty new uh, as well, new concepts for us all to get our heads around. Um, a couple of sort of headline points to make, first of all. The first is that the GDPR... I don't think really from a business's perspective is as bad as we perhaps feared it might end up being. And I'm sure many of you listening were um, uh, had, had become familiar with some of the more draconian provisions that were being debated and some of the more drastic measures that, that were being taken, particularly in the uh, discussions coming out of the European Parliament. By and large, a lot of the provisions have been watered down to a, to a greater or lesser extent from those that we've heard about in the last few years. Um, the second general point to make is that not all of the new obligations 
in the GDPR will apply to all organizations. And for a lot of these obligations, there is a specific test which will apply, which will determine whether or not your organization needs to comply with that obligation. The difficulty, I'm afraid, is that the test that uh, you have to apply to decide whether you have to comply with an obligation differ from obligation to obligation, as you'll see in a moment when I, when I go through them. Okay, so um, starting off, first of all, on the um, obligation to maintain privacy by design and default. And this is one of those grand uh, sweeping concepts that uh, European legislators are so keen on, a bit like the first data protection principle. It sort of means everything and, and nothing at the same time. But in practice, I think what we can get from it is that it imposes a far greater emphasis on um, determining at the outset of your uh, data processing. So before you really embark on processing, before you put in place a system, an IT system, a data storage system, determining what the risks are and actually designing those systems with um, a very keen eye on data protection compliance and your obligations under the GDPR. And it's particularly when you're acquiring technology and, and new data storage systems. Um, now, all of that's a bit generic, a bit difficult to see how on earth you would know if you were complying or not. And the, and the, the, the text of the GDPR does give a certain degree of guidance and help. Um, it talks about concepts like data minimization, making sure you don't hold more data than is necessary, only allowing access to data to those individuals who actually need access in order to process the data, and putting in place appropriate technical and security measures, um, taking into account the nature of the data that you hold and the, and the privacy risks that you, that you face. The second new obligation to mention is the record keeping obligations in the GDPR. And this is all part and parcel of the accountability principle, as they, as they call it. Um, and and what, what that means is that it's not enough simply to be compliant with the GDPR. You have to be able to demonstrate compliance by reference to uh, descriptions and, and written records and, and the activities that you're actually undertaking. Um, and and sim put simply, the record keeping requirements um, will, will um, oblige organizations to document in writing the manner and nature of the processing it's carrying out. Now, you probably think, well, this seems like an extraordinarily uh, tedious and tiresome exercise, and, and doubtless it will be in many instances. But um, the, the good news, it has to be said, is that because of these obligations, these tax obligations in the GDPR, um, you will no longer, as an organization, need to make your annual uh, notification to the local uh, regulator uh, and fill in the form and pay the annual fee. But they are doing away with that altogether. And instead, you have to sort of self-police, if you like, your, uh, your compliance and record keeping and, and, and so on. Now, this obligation doesn't apply to every organization. It applies to every organization which has two, at least 250 employees. Now, that's actually only 1% of businesses in the UK. But also, every organization for which data processing, personal data processing, is not occasional. Now, it strikes me that um, that probably captures most organizations. So, it remains to be seen how that, uh, that test will, will actually be applied and will, will um, hopefully be getting rather more guidance from the uh, Commission in the forthcoming months uh, and years. Um, you have to keep these records, and the regulator can request copies of these records at any time. Um, and if you are unable to produce them, then you will be uh, contravening the GDPR. The next new obligation is uh, around impact assessments, and this is more of the same, uh, really. But this applies to all data controllers, all organizations. There is no test that has to be met uh, here. And essentially, you have to sit down and, and document in writing uh, the, uh, a, a description of any new processing you're about to undertake, uh, a description of the risks, the privacy risks, and how you're actually going to address them. And then you have to keep those records on, on file again to be disclosed to the regulator if, uh, if requested. Now, you don't have to do this in respect of all new processing. It's only processing where there is a specific privacy risk. And you have to determine yourself whether or not you think you pass that test. But one thing that the GDPR says is that if you're using brand new technology in a new way, it may well be the case that 
there is a specific privacy risk you have to consider. And also, if you're undertaking widespread CCTV, um, using widespread uh, CCTV on a large-scale basis or any large-scale automated profiling, that will automatically uh, be captured by the uh, impact assessment test. Um, moving on now to the requirement to appoint a data protection officer, and there's been a lot of commentary and concern about this uh, over the last few years. And where we've actually ended up um, is um, considerably different to the place we were in, um, uh, certainly in terms of the draft, um, uh, original draft um, of the GDPR, and in respect to the, what the European Parliament were pushing for. So originally there was uh, the test for determining whether you needed to appoint an officer was um, by reference to the number of employees, and the Parliament wanted the test to be by reference to the number of data subjects whose uh, uh, data you were processing. Those tests have gone out the window. Um, what the, uh, the test now is, is simply uh, that you have to appoint a data protection officer if you are a public authority, or if your core activities consist of the regular and systematic monitoring of individuals on a large scale. Um, now, again, I, I personally um, struggle to advise clients at the moment whether or not they would need to uh, appoint a data protection officer on that test. So whether or not their core activities consist of monitoring uh, does consist mean that that is the absolute key fundamental uh, obligation, um, or does it mean that it includes your, your activities? We don't yet know. Um, but anyway, the um, uh, the data protection officer that you appoint will operate independently of the business that it works for, will report to management, uh, and will have to advise the company of its obligations to comply with data protection, and will also be the point of liaison with um, regulators. Um, moving on now to um, notification of data security breaches, um, and, and this obviously strains the whole area, area of hacking and cyber security and so on. The UK law does not currently require uh, organizations to notify regulators or data subjects if there has been a, a data security breach, although for a long time it has been the Information Commission's best practice to do so in certain circumstances. Um, the original draft of the legislation suggested you have to tell the regulator every time there is a personal data security breach, and common sense prevailed, thankfully, in the final draft, such that um, you don't need to notify the regulator if the, uh, the security breach is unlikely to result in a privacy risk. Again, you have to apply that test yourself. And you won't have much time to think about applying that test because there are also timing obligations on the uh, notification duties. You have to notify the regulator of the security breach without undue delay, and in any event, within 72 hours of becoming aware of that security breach. And you can imagine that uh, if the breach is, is discovered on a, on a Friday night, for example, it's going to be quite tricky to, to um, pull together all the necessary information to make that, uh, make that notification. You will also um, have to notify all of the data subjects um, without undue delay, but only if the data privacy breach is likely to result in a high risk to uh, their privacy. So again, you have to apply the test to yourself quite quickly. And then finally, just turning to fines and penalties, and probably the bit that's of most interest to most, certainly most boardrooms um, when, when looking at the GDPR. Um, what the GDPR has done has said that each country can set its own maximum fine, um, and um, uh, the maximum fine in each instance cannot be more than uh, either 10 million euros, the greater of 10 million euros, and um, 2% uh, of turnover for, for a certain category, a uh, certain tier of um, uh, contraventions of GDPR, or a maximum of 20 million euros and 4% of turnover for more severe uh, contraventions of the GDPR. And um, the sorts of um, uh, uh, contraventions that would, uh, for which the higher tariff would apply will be um, contravention of the first data protection principle, not processing data securely, and breaching the um, um, obligations to uh, around uh, transfer of data overseas. Um, just finally, on damages and the um, risks around um, damages and the ability for individuals to make claims um, for um, 
uh, contraventions uh, where an organization has contravened the, the GDPR. The current um, position where individuals can seek damages um, is going to be maintained and um, uh, nothing has changed there and that will be entirely open-ended. There are no caps on the uh, potential liability of organizations. Um, just a few words now on territoriality and um, what the GDPR is doing with respect to overseas company, uh, companies. Um, in, its, in essence, it's widening the, uh, the net such that um, organizations which are um, actually outside the EU and which hitherto are not subject to data protection compliance obligations will fall within the GDPR in certain circumstances. And this is particularly of interest, I think, to online uh, businesses in the US that offer online uh, uh, offerings to, to people in Europe. And that's because the test for determining whether or not the GDPR will apply to you as a business outside the EU is whether or not you are offering goods or services to individuals who reside in the EU or whether you're monitoring individuals in the EU. Now, um, the question then is, well, if we have a website in, uh, in the US and it is accessible by individuals in the EU, um, does that mean we are captured? Well, the answer to that is no. And actually, the GDPR is quite helpful in this respect if you look at the recitals. And it, and it acknowledges that simply having a website which is accessible in the EU does not of itself mean that your business will be subject to the GDPR. But it, it talks about uh, notions like, um, does your website uh, use the language of a, a country in the EU? Um, now, with English, of course, that doesn't really work but certainly French, German, Spanish, and so on. Uh, do you actually make it possible for individuals in the EU to, to purchase the goods and services? Do you accept euros um, or sterling? Do you mention European customers in um, testimonials and so on? And all these things will be looked at in determining whether or not you um, are going to be subject to the GDPR, notwithstanding the fact that you're based outside the EU. Um, and the other point to make on territoriality is around the one Stop shop, and there's been an enormous amount of debate uh, around this um, over the last um, couple of years. Um, where we've actually ended up um, is not uh, is, is a rather watered down position. Originally, the, the Commission was very keen to ensure that if you operate in multiple European jurisdictions, you will always know which um, regulator you are uh, dealing with, and you will know which country's compliance regime you are subject to. That's, I'm afraid, not quite the way it ended up. Um, you have to uh, nominate a main establishment if you are operating in multiple jurisdictions. And in theory, that main establishment's regulator will be policing your activity. But it's not quite that straightforward. And that's because, um, first of all, the regulator in question can, if it decides uh, it is the best thing to do, hand over the enforcement and investigation of any contraventions to a, uh, another regulator. In any event, other regulators can pitch in effectively and can, can, uh, uh, and can get involved in enforcement actions and, and can challenge a regulator's enforcement action. And then most importantly of all, individuals are uh, entitled to take action in any member state that they want. They don't have to take uh, action against the uh, data controller in that controller's main uh, establishment. Um, just a few words briefly on appointing processors. I'm sure many of you are familiar with, with the concept of a processor being an organization that processing data on behalf of a, of a controller. Um, and uh, that concept is not changing. And by and large, the obligations imposed on controllers to um, uh, around the, the appointment of processors is also uh, not not changing as well, the requirement for binding contracts and, and so on and, and so forth. Um, however, there is also now a, a new obligation on a controller when they are appointing a processor to be able to show quite clearly that their processor can guarantee data security. But the biggest change of all is that data processors under the GDPR will actually be subject to the European Data Protection Compliance Regime. Currently, a processor can effectively hide behind a controller and its duties um, with regards to data um, protection, data security, are contractual duties that are enshrined in its contract with the controller. And it can, of course, manage 
its risk under that contract. What the GDPR does is to say that actually processors will be uh, uh, liable for their own contraventions of um, whilst acting as a processor, and they will have to answer to their local regulators. Now, not all of the GDPR will apply to processes, but most of it will, and certainly the points I've talked about today uh, will, so the obligations on record keeping, impact assessments, appointments of data protection officers, and so on, all of that will apply to, to data processes, and, and processes will be subject to exactly the same, same um, penalty regime, the maximum fines, and also they could be sued by uh, individuals uh, as well, just in the same way that controllers, uh, controllers can. Um, the next two slides, I won't go through in any detail, but this is just a very simple um, uh, review of, of, of a few um, provisions um, and concepts in data protection um, which we are currently subject to. And we'll look at on the, on the slide what, um, what will be changing under the GDPR. You can go through those at your leisure uh, subsequently, and I've, I've already touched on, on some of these uh, already. What I wanted to do now is just to hand over to Sharon, who will um, give us her view of the U.S. perspective on the GDPR. Thank you, Dan, for the excellent summary on the GDPR. And from you know, a United States uh, perspective, a lot of our clients are concerned about three things. Who will be the lead? As Dan said, you need a designated main establishment and a main regulator. So what would be the best choice for our clients and U.S. businesses? Um, breach notification. Well, that's one area that from a United States perspective, we've had a ton of experience in. And our initial reaction to the GDPR is that breach notification is very fast and very subjective. Um, Dan mentioned the 72 hours, um, which uh, you would need to report to the regulator um, unless it's not likely to result in a privacy risk, and then to the individual if it would result in high risk. Um, what is high risk? Um, what does not likely mean? Um, those are elements that are incredibly subjective and in who will decide. Um, but what is clear is that our clients need to move fast and have processes in place in the EU and interdisciplinary teams, as Dan said, when you get that notification of a security incident on that Friday evening. Um, one of the things in the United States that we have discovered with um, states that require very fast breach notification is that you don't have time to do a complete root cause analysis or mitigation. And so sometimes the notification um, too quickly leads to misinformation. So that is a caution that I think um, we have from a U.S. perspective on the breach notification. And as Dan was indicating, the, the really focus on data processors and privacy by design, um, looking at those contracts to assure security, making sure that there is an impact assessment, um, adding to the contracts the provisions that are necessary for the GDPR, um, erasure, reporting, notice, maintaining those documents and records, um, the data breach notification requirements that we talked about. And it's really important to get this right because if it's noncompliant, as Dan indicated, you know, we're looking at huge fines and penalties much bigger um, than some in the United States if there is a security breach. So those are the high-level things that from a U.S. perspective um, is our reaction, you know, as we see the current state of the GDPR. Uh, next slide. So where do the businesses go from here? So on transfers of personal data to the United States, if you are previously a safe harbor certified company, it probably makes sense to sit tight and we, you know, as Dan indicated, believe that the EU will agree with the U.S and put in place the privacy shield. Uh, but at the same time, it makes a lot of sense to review alternatives, model clauses, consent, um, and also look at whether you need to have personalized information at all. Um, if you can, limit that 
to the minimum necessary and de-identify and anonymize before it goes from the EU to the United States, you really can help yourself in terms of um, not having to be as highly regulated and concerned. And finally, I think in terms of the transfers of personal data, you should also take the time uh, to make sure that you not only stated that you were compliant with the seven privacy principles, but actually that you've achieved compliance, that you've put in place those processes and initiatives that are the building blocks for compliance under the safe harbor as well as the privacy shield. So those are the things that I think businesses can proactively do um, as we sit here today. Dan? Okay, thank you, Sharon. Um, I, I'm afraid I, I couldn't quite hear what you were saying. I think it might be a problem at my end, I'm not sure. But um, just m moving on to um, how we uh, advise um, what we're saying to, to businesses at the moment with respect to the uh, implementation of the, uh, of the GDPR, I think the first thing to, to, to do is to establish which obligations under the GDPR will actually apply to your organization. As I've said, there are different tests that apply in each instance, and uh, it, it's actually quite difficult at the moment. Some of these um, are fairly subjective. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's unclear whether they will apply, but I think thought certainly needs to be given sooner rather than later to whether or not you are going to need to appoint, for example, a data protection officer. And we need to keep an eye on the, um, the guidance that we're going to be given by, uh, hopefully given by the, by the European Commission in forthcoming months and, uh, and months and years. The second thing that I would suggest is that we, uh, we advise is that um, organizations put in place a, a framework for, for accountability. Um, and it's not, not just about having policies and, and written policies and, and so on and procedures, all of which you will need, but actually establishing a culture of accountability for data protection compliance. Um, I mean, there's a few easy wins which any organization can, can achieve. Um, minimization of your data processing activities and, um, and looking at retention of data. How much data do you hold? Do you really need to hold all that data? The less that you've got, the, the smaller the problems when, when things go wrong. Also, start trying to um, put in place and use auditable and um, privacy impact assessments. You're going to need to do impact assessments, so you might as well start practicing sooner rather than later. Um, I think the next thing to advise is to prepare for data security uh, breaches. You know, can you meet your the 72-hour deadline for notification to a regulator, if you discover that your systems have been have been uh, accessed on an unauthorized basis, or you your members of staff have um, have lost the laptop, um, for example, um, you know this this I think is going to be extremely extremely challenging. Can you contact all your data subjects easily and quickly and give them all the information that you need you need to to, to give them? Um, you need to have a, a rapid response team in place sooner rather than later. Um, and that will have to include individuals from uh, all aspects of the business, uh, legal, uh, PR, insurance, uh, operations, IT, and they will all need to know what their roles are and be able to act very quickly in the event of a data security breach. And then finally, the final tip, I think, is to uh, question whether or not you are a data processor um, and whether previously you've not had to concern yourself with uh, um, regulatory compliance, you, you simply focused on the obligations to uh, your, your customers, the, the data controllers, and start thinking about whether or not you need to, to implement some of these new, new measures and start gearing yourself up for, for, for direct um, regulatory compliance duties. Okay, well that's, um, I think, all that we were going to, um, to cover, um, and we wanted to, to go through a few questions, um, if possible. Brian, I don't know whether there are any questions that you've spotted or whether... Um. Um, Brian and Dan, um, we had one that, that we could answer. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, one of the questions that came in is, um, why do we need a privacy shield at all? Um, why can't we simply go for model clauses? And the, the answer that we would give is that um, the privacy shield is flexible, and it does um, provide some benefit 
uh, from a less administrative burden and process perspective if you have multiple model clauses that you need to put into place. So model clauses are great, and if you can administer them, um, perhaps you, know, you could rely on that alternative, uh, but understand that you're gonna need model clauses on a one-by-one -one basis with entities. Those entities' names may change. They will need updating and care and feeding. So there's a lot of process and contract management to assure that those framework of model clauses uh, remain in place. And so if you couple the model clauses with a privacy shield, um, that would allow for far broader transfers and flow of data uh, from the EU to the United States um, with, with multiple partners uh, with potentially um, less administrative burden. So that's sort of the, the back and forth on um, why a privacy shield and model clauses uh, might be belt and suspenders. Okay, um, there's a question which I've uh, been asked as well, which um, I assume has come from um, the states, which is um, if we are a non-EU controller, so we meet the test for offering goods and services in the EU, do we need to nominate a representative, a data protection representative in the EU? Um, and yeah, this is something I didn't actually, I didn't touch on, but uh, the answer to that is yes, possibly. Um, the idea being that uh, if you are one of these um, overseas controllers, that there will be uh, an organization who the regulators can actually deal with and, and liaise with on the ground in the EU. Um, what the GDPR says is that you um, uh, will only um, have to, um, or you won't have to appoint um, um, a representative if your processing uh, is only occasional, um, if it's not sensitive data, and if it's unlikely to result in uh, a privacy risk to the individuals in question. So again, it, it captures quite a lot of the, the concepts that we've seen and the, and the tests um, that, that, we've already, that we've already described. Um, but just to be absolutely clear, that representative in the European Union will not itself be uh, responsible. It will not be liable for contraventions of the GDPR. It will still be the overseas entity which is in the firing line to, to, to the regulators. Perhaps just one, there are several questions on consent that came in um, and, you know, what is the test for consent? And I, I know we only have 30 seconds, so this is a real short answer. Um, is consent a viable option? Um, it can be, but you really need to think and make sure that it's freely given, specific, informed, unambiguous, um, and again, as, as Alex indicated, you need direct contact with the data subject to get there. So. Um, those are the sort of considerations when we think about consent as an option uh, for cross-border data transfer. Dan, I don't know if you have anything to add, but we are at the hour mark, and we want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, thank you for joining us. We are recording the webinar today. We'll share that link to everyone that registered. We do have the questions that came in. We did have a number that we were not able to get to and I'll work with the uh, speakers to come up with some answers that we can distribute to the attendees uh, offline. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. I think it was a great webinar, and be on the lookout for that email with the recording that should come out later today from Pepper or Travers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.